day and welcome back to another episode of the 40 Yorty Podcast with your host, Mr. Thomas Henley, of course. Today, I've got a bit of a different episode for you and I just want to put a very heavy trigger warning at the start of this. We're going to be talking about a lot of the very dark stuff of life, dark stuff of mental health. We're talking about autism and suicide, which is, you know, it's it's obviously going to be an episode where we, we sort of dive into our own personal experiences with it. So if you do feel that you're not in a state that you will be able to um, be okay with listening to this, I would highly advise checking out one of the other episodes that I have on the podcast. Uh, but I really think that due to the nature of the statistics around autism, suicide, and mental health, I think it's a really important episode to at least talk about that kind of stuff for the people who may need it, or at least to give some awareness to the mainstream around these very uh, worrying statistics in the autistic community. So before we get into introducing our guest, uh, I do want to cover one of the more recent studies that was published by Autistica, which is a a UK-based autism organization. And they have some, some pretty up-to-date stats as far, as far as I can find. It was one that was done in 2017. I'm sure there's some that have been done a bit later, but I, I do have personal links with Autistica and I know that they you know, produce some quite high quality stuff. So this uh, Autistica study um, found that um, almost eight in 10 autistic people have a diagnosed mental health condition, which is quite astonishing. That can be anything from anxiety to depression to all the other kind of things that 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 would cover. There's also quite a worrying statistic around thinking about suicide. About six in 10 people, so it's more than half, it's more likely that autistic people would consider suicide. There's also a very concerning statistic around three in 10 autistic people um, autistic adults have attempted suicide. There are some statistics around sort of more younger life childhood experiences, but I don't think it's something that I want to go into too much because I know even for me, you know, it's something that I talk about and it's something that I've experienced, but even for me, it was, it was quite hard to, uh, read some of the stats around that. So now we set a bit of a basis to why we are doing this podcast and a little bit of a disclaimer. I went to give a bit of a a background to my uh, guest, Hina, who I met during a conference, doing like a public speaking event in Birmingham. It's called the EDA conference, and it was funded by the Commonwealth Games. Uh, It was an opportunity for a lot of autistic individuals to come and speak and deliver presentations and talk to different policymakers to try and make some systemic change in the way that we deal with emotional regulation, mental health, things of that nature. So it was a really, really great event. And um, Hina came up to me noticing from me from Instagram, which was one of the first times that that's happened. So I was very buzzed about it. I was like, hey, this is, you know, people are recognizing me outside of Instagram. And we got a picture. Uh, we had a call more recently, chatted about possibly making this episode. And uh, here we are. So Hina, how are you doing? Um, I'm doing very well, thank you, Thomas. I'm excited to be on the podcast. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, would you like to give a little bit of a background into, you know, when you were when you were diagnosed and and I suppose how you sort of got involved in the the autistic community and what kind of stuff that you you do on a daily. Yeah, so um, my name's Hina, I'm 25, and I work as a community engagement officer on a, in a daily basis. Um, so finding out, well, discovering that I was autistic, I didn't actually figure it out by myself. It was my younger sister, because she's a speech and language therapist, and she said to me uh-huh. one day, yeah, she said to me, she was like, um, I think you might be autistic, and I was like, really like do you actually think that and she was like yeah 
And when she told me about it, um, I was like, oh, actually, a lot of that makes sense to me. And I can relate to many of the things that you're talking to me about. So Mm -hmm. a lot of the behavioral traits and sensory processing things that I just thought was like typical and everyone else experienced. Yeah. (laughs) And you just, you just like, you just like, just for some reason, can't tolerate it for something that's like a personality trait. Like, uh, because that's what I thought. I was like, Maybe I'm just weak. Maybe I just like can't handle these emotions and these sensory experiences as much of, as other people. That's literally what I used to think because I used to just cry out of nowhere. And my dad, bless him, he would be like, why are you crying? And I'd say, I don't know. I'm just crying and I don't know why. And he said, well, if you don't know why, you can stop. And I was like, I can't. But there was mm-hmm. a reason. I think it was just like feeling sensory overload and just super overwhelmed really with life Mm, um mm. but yeah and then my sister she motivated me to go to the doctors um which was very hesitant to do because (laughs) as you know um it's not an easy process no (laughs) yeah it's quite um and there's a lot of stigma attached to it as well but um I finally got the courage to do it and I went and ever since I've actually been on the waiting list and referred by my doctor for nearly two years now I think so yeah it's a long process (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's a long process but another thing is I went to a suicide prevention conference as part of work that was held at the University of Wolverhampton and I met Mm -hmm. a colleague that I work with now um called David Stocks and he is a suicide prevention lead in the community and he does a lot of work based around autism because he's also recently been diagnosed um around like a year ago as autistic oh. and he's in his 50s so um he does a lot of work with the autistic community hmm. um and we're working on an autism and suicide prevention project in work wow. so that's really exciting that's amazing and what what kind of i don't know how much you're allowed to divulge but what would that kind of entail like is it more of like a like a document thing or is it like education for like different authorities or or, um, organizations or is it more like a like an internal program to support individuals um i would say it's a very creative project so the main focus is going to be involving people with lived experience of autism um, designing mm. the project and also taking part in it. So the main thing that we're going to do is we're going to use um, cameras <laughs> to take pictures um, to reflect emotions that autistic people feel and just things that people feel attracted to. Like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah, I relate to that. And then afterwards, we will also be writing some poetry or short um, sentences or words to reflect the images. And then the end goal is to have four exhibitions separately. So um, in wow. four of the boroughs in the West Midlands. Um, so that should be exciting. Um, yeah. And then everyone can Very see cool. it and be like, oh, look at this cool project. But yeah, thank you. That's really cool. It actually brings brings me um brings to mind like a one individual that I had a pre chat with. Uh we still we still haven't got around to sorting out sort of doing the podcast, but they do they're called uh Sousa Fine Arts and they communicate on online mostly through like self portraiture and they do something like quite similar to that, like around um very, very cool uh quirky person. Um but um they they do those self portraits and they have like it's based on everyday life events that that happen everyday feelings that they experience and they try and capture that with their own sort of self portraiture so they might they might be quite a cool person to link up with if you're doing that that project they're neurodiverse themselves so thank you yeah well i know we've we've talked a little bit about the statistics around mental health, autism, and suicide. It's obviously like a massive issue, and the amount of coverage that it has in the mainstream media is just absolutely ridiculously low considering how you know out there solid the statistics have been over the over the course of what like 20 years. It's it's 
very much something that is happening and something that affects a lot of people who are autistic. So I suppose given those mental health statistics, if we were to talk mostly about mental health at the start, why do you think autistic people are more prone to these mental health conditions? Personally, I think the reason that autistic people are more prone to mental health conditions is due to a lack of diagnosis at a younger age. So waiting until you're adult to be diagnosed, um, because then presenting with a lot of autistic traits can be confused for other illnesses or like other mm. diagnoses. BPD, or, yeah. you know, bipolar, exactly. schizophrenia you. even. <laughs> exactly. And I, th- I don't know if it's because of like a lack of education or awareness in the mental health system itself. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But um, I definitely think that's a really big factor, uh, especially then people becoming misdiagnosed as well. Because I was misdiagnosed as well. I've been misdiagnosed um, with obsessive compulsive disorder. And I might it might right. be a part of me, you know, it might be part of the autism. Yeah, it was just there is like a component of there is a like a component of autism that's like quite obsessive and (laughs) I know there is yeah I know that there's my friend uh, Nick Ransom he's like this guy who works for the BBC he um he's worked with like he worked with Chris Packham on that that documentary that that you know um has become quite popular yeah he's quite he's quite in there (laughs) in the mainstream media. And he does a lot of stuff around autism and things like that. It's really cool. Uh, but he he struggles with like OCD and things like that. Particularly around like people and relationships. For some reason, he has like what he terms like relationship OCD. It's a very like old podcast. It was in like season one, probably like episode 14. So that's quite a while ago. <laughs> but, that's super cool. Yeah. I I think there is like some some crossovers with that. I would also say like, you know, from misdiagnosis and and things like that, women uh, and and people of backgrounds that are not white, I think, are more likely to be misdiagnosed. <laughs> Me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, more likely I, to be misdiagnosed and undiagnosed. I definitely agree with you. Um, being. Asian myself and a woman um I yeah I agree I think it's also because women are much better at masking or I don't know if they're Mm. better they just feel like they should mask I don't know because I definitely did mask a lot in my youth if I look back because I I didn't know how I was supposed to act (laughs) I had no clue so I used to just pick up on um other people's behaviors and tone of voice and the way that they would interact so that I could fit in. And I actually think that is another part of like why autistic people are more prone to mental health conditions because we're like expected to fit into like this mold um, like everyone else. Um, and I, I always like think of it and describe it as like being neurodivergent in a world that's like designed for neurotypicals. So mm-hmm. it's really just, I don't know how we're supposed to be comfortable enough to be ourselves in a place that doesn't make us feel able to be so yeah and it is quite it's quite a protective thing isn't it because you know that there, there, there are situations particularly in secondary school or high school over in the u.s that present a lot of real world dangers or real world stresses like bullying and you know if you kind of stick out and people notice that and people sort of take advantage of you, perhaps not understanding um, like the, the the higher cognitive, like social situations that are going on, then they do take advantage of you. So there is like that aspect to it, even in the workplace, I would say. I know for me, I didn't really used to mask very much, but I, I definitely used to have some like mirroring like behaviors so i (laughs) there'd been lots of situations when i was younger and i was introduced to someone from like a different part of the uk like scotland and i'd start just naturally mimicking their accent 
And obviously they were like, oh, what's happening there? And the, the parents are like looking and asking, why is, why is your child doing this? For me, it was it was a way of relating to that person, making them feel like they're, they're, they're safer to be around me. But I, I understand like looking back on it that it's not ideal. And, and to be honest, even within my podcast, if if you kind of look back at the different guests that I have on, the way that I interact with people, the way that I speak, like the tonality of my voice, it tends to very much mimic the person that I'm talking to. And it's not like a natural process. It's not like I'm thinking, right, I need to do this and this. It's just kind of like a learnt thing. I don't know. It's 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 interesting, isn't it? And masking, I think, just in general, can have some really bad effects on uh, your identity as a person. It can feel very hard to feel like you're being genuine. It can take a really big toll on your like overall energy. It can really yeah. make you look more anxious and aware and paranoid in social situations. It's something that I only really started to to do when I was in my early 20s. I started to like realize that the people around me, they were having a much better time in terms of making friends, forming groups at university, um, and also finding a partner. And those, those things were were areas of my life that I wanted to work on quite a lot of, at that age. And it started to like mimic and mask and copy people online who <laughs> seem to, to have that life to them, to have that aspect of their personality to make those friends. But when I did, it always just felt very false and it didn't feel like I was connecting deeply with other people which I think is another really big aspect of mental health, that social element. I agree with you completely. Um, I definitely personally experienced this like feeling of I didn't know who I was and I didn't know who mm. I was supposed to be. So I used to constantly like wonder what my identity was. Um, sure. And I, I think that identity is like always evolving anyway. But there is definitely some parts of yourself that are more solid. And I just didn't know because I was constantly presenting as typical, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, like passing, but, passing as neurotypical. Yeah. And I was really good at it, but now, mm -hmm. um, and it was so tiring. It was so tiring. I used to be exhausted um, after the end of the day, like after school, in secondary school, um, and then also in the workplace as well, like you mentioned, um, mm. I experienced a lot of stigma um, yeah. in the workplace, which made me feel really unsafe because the reasonable adjustments that were supposed to be put in place weren't put in place. <laughs> instead, oh I was just, yeah, instead I was meant to just... And those are like bare you know, bones as well, anyway. Like. Exactly. <laughs> so I was really like worried and anxious and stressed every time I went to work but I've been mm. trying to educate the workplace um on autism and neurodivergence mm. so that they can be more understanding and accommodating of people's needs sure well that's great I, I'd say that like another aspect of autism and mental health I mean just from like the scientific perspective of um how things like depression develop like a, a lot of it is, a lot of it tends to occur due to either long term chronic pain or long term emotional pain, um, which kind of inbuilts, inbuilds this sort of catastrophizing, doom and gloom sort of attitude to life. Or at least it, ha it had for me. And this is all uh, based around this idea of the HPA axis, which is, oh, what's it called? <laughs> There's a pituitary gland, which is the P. There's adrenal gland, which is the, you know, A. And then there's the H, yep. which is the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus. And there's this this weird sort of feedback mechanism with all of these kind of things. And when you are chronically anxious for a long period of time, it can it can kind of have these these different physical changes in your brain, which can make you more prone to developing things like depression. And, and having that anxiety for a long, longer period of time. So that's kind of like the, the scientific 
sort of idea of it. And if you think about the lives of autistic people, you know, we're constantly bombarded with sensory, social stresses, uh, a lot of negative life situations, uh, particularly for, for women, I would say, around being sort of manipulated or, or abused in, in different ways. And so it kind of makes sense to me why we tend to develop these quite severe mental health conditions, even, even at a young age. I think there's another aspect of life that, you know, seems to be quite important to touch on, which is like the life, the overall life quality statistics that we might have as autistic people. We tend to find it very hard to find a job, a long-term job and feeling happy within that job and, you know, feeling safe. There's also the aspect of isolation, which is very, very apparent. Even going up to individuals who, you know, are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, um, who haven't really had the supports that we might have had uh, growing up on that, that level of acceptance and adjustments in place, even though it's not perfect. Up until, you know, even nowadays, things like social media, uh, the on online spaces, general support after school, that sort of transition to adulthood is, is you know, there's, there's so many aspects to someone's life quality that prevents us from fully being in included and happy socially and, and in society, which, you know, it can't be undermined just how, how much that can affect people's mental health, you know. You hear about a lot of this concept called atomization, which seems to be going on, which is like the splitting off of social groups where, you know, a lot of people are kind of in their own house, uh, in their own space, but a lot of their friends are all over the place. You know, they, they might be into like online gaming or be very into social media. So all of their friends are like dotted around the country or the world. And so there's not that immediate sort of social structure. Um, that can support them, which can be an issue, I think. I agree with you. And I actually have a lot of friends who are dotted around the world. Um, through like, Me um, too. Yeah, it's <laughs> insane. But they're like some of the best people that I know and some of the best mm -hmm. people in my life um, through online gaming and online platforms and interacting I find also unlike posts, for example, that I follow on Instagram, um, surrounding mm -hmm. like autism, ADHD, neurodivergence, and mental health. Um, I usually comment on the posts if I feel like um I relate to it, and then I, I feel like you can meet people that way too, and just mm. you know, common ground. But yeah. yeah, the the good thing about I suppose the good thing about the online spaces is that you can find a lot of autistic people. Whereas if you go outside and you try and meet new people, it's very hard to find them sometimes. <laughs> I agree. And it's not, like, it's not like you have a big autism sign above your head. <laughs> I'm autistic. Be friends with me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's funny because I, I, I tend to very much attract and make friends with a lot of neurodivergent people, just not, not even by going to seek them out. Me too. It's just, it just seems to happen. <laughs> and also, I definitely feel like um, I connect better with other neurodivergent people um, sure. and communicating with them is so much easier than communicating with neurotypicals. Yeah. And I, I suppose it doesn't necessarily have to be like autistic or ADHD individuals that you meet. I think it's just someone who has experienced a different side of life kind of give, gives them that perspective to understand or want to understand other people's like different sides of life. Like if I'm just thinking of individuals, you know, there's, I don't think there's anybody that I know that doesn't have something different about them in some way. Indeed. I agree. But that's what makes us so like special because everyone's different and everyone's unique. And it's wonderful. Yeah. Oh, I also, I do think as well, um, communicating with other neurodiverse people um, is easier because maybe we've created like our own understanding of neurodiverse social cues that make sense to us. <laughs> I don't mm. know. Uh, perhaps. 
I definitely think I I have my own way of communicating and I'm very like before I would be very much stressed about trying to fit into a certain model of communicating and socializing. Whereas nowadays I'm very much like, you know, I'm just going to communicate as I, as I do. And if it feels a bit weird for you, then cool. Let's not be friends. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree with you. That's, I suppose that's one of the, you know, it can be one of the hard bits about like unmasking is because although you are becoming your more authentic self and you are displaying yourself to the world and you're feeling more authentic in, in how you do that, it does also present issues when it comes to fitting in and it can sometimes make it harder to find people to be friends with. And it can also, if you've masked for a long time and you have that, that those kind of social groups and you start to unmask, then it, it can sometimes lead to you losing friends or, you know, people making weird comments like you're more autistic nowadays or, you know, why are you leaning so much into the label and things like that? Yeah, it really frustrates me. Um, it's, well, the people that we're more authentic around are those who make us feel like we can be um, yeah. because they're comfortable and we feel safe with them. So if we are masking, it's generally because we don't feel like we can be our authentic self with them, sure. with people. But yeah. Definitely. Well, um, we talked a little bit about the sort of the prevalence of mental health and why why it may happen. Um, for a lot of autistic, autistic people, there is also different cross sections between groups, um, different aspects of an autistic life that can make, you know, mental health conditions more apparent, you know, just from looking at things like even the coping mechanisms around uh, addiction, alcohol, and, and different uh, various use of drugs. It's very, it's very prevalent uh, for autistic people. And, you know, I am at some, some point going to be sort of diving into an episode where I can talk more in, in depth on things like alexithymia. I suppose like one of, one of the key aspects of doing this podcast is to get a bit more sort of personal on things because it's all well and good to kind of postulate and like the theories behind it. But I know for a lot of people, it can be really hard to find. Oh, it was particularly hard for me to find uh, resources and people talking about um, subjects that, that are quite hard to hear and subjects that they do hit quite personally. But it was definitely something that I wanted to find when I was in the peak of my mental health conditions. So I guess, what are your experiences with mental health and, and you know, suicidal ideation. Uh, I, I will give my experiences as well, but um, please go ahead. <laughs> okay, um, cool. So my experiences, I think I've been from quite a young age. Um, when I was in secondary school, I experienced a lot of um, suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation. Um, and I think it was generally because life just felt like a lot and way too much for me to handle. Um, mm -hmm. And I just wanted a way out, like an easy way out. And I know yeah. suicide is not easy, but it feels like it would be easier than just staying trapped in society, in the world that, yeah. that's yeah. making you feel like crap. Um, and I think another thing that fed into my thoughts and feelings was um, some of my childhood, personal childhood experiences, which I won't go into, but I think that definitely played a part as well. Um, sure. And from the age of 16, I remember, was when I first entered mental health services and mental health support. Um, mm -hmm. So that was through CAMS. Um, I think. Ah, uh, me too. <laughs> yeah, you know about CAMS. <laughs> so is yeah. it like, um, I think it's Child and Adult Mental Health Services. I think that's what the acronym stands for. I think that sounds right. Thank you. <laughs> I did well. Uh, um, yeah, so that's where I first got support, but it wasn't like for depression or anxiety specifically although I was struggling heavily with that it was for obsessive compulsive disorder yes yeah which I think developed as a result of 
coexisting mental illness, but was also a component of autism. <laughs> so yes. yeah. it was all related and I didn't have a clue because I couldn't regulate my emotions and my feelings and I was just trying my best to to stay alive. And in a way, the OCD kept me alive, if that even makes sense, because it gave me a way of like, I don't know. You have like the rituals and yeah. things that kind of focused you in. Yeah. So I was like, um, if I do this, then I won't feel like this. So if I do that, then this won't happen. But mm-hmm. if I think about it, like if you think about it objectively, it's it's not like, it's not going to happen like that. It doesn't work like that, but it makes you feel better. And, and I think a lot of it is to do with, for me, was to do with a lack of control um, and yeah. having having these like rituals and thoughts and things that I used to do um, really helped me to just put all that into perspective and feel like I was in control of something. If I wasn't in control of my mind or like my emotions, I was in control of everything in my external environment. But sure. although it did help, it kind of destroyed my life as well. <laughs> it took it over a lot because um, I used to spend like, a very long time in the shower because the OCD that I had was contamination OCD. Right, right. It was quite debilitating. That must have been really, I don't know if it's something that you experienced, but that must have been really hard sort of during COVID and things like that. Was that an issue? Um, It was hard, but it wasn't as difficult because thankfully um, the brunt of that was during my youth. I think during my um late secondary school years and college years so during college um I remember this is another thing because when you're autistic you like things to go to plan (laughs) Um, yes yeah but things didn't go to plan so I went to college um and it took me about an hour and a bit to get there and the same amount of time back um but because I had to complete all my rituals (laughs) and shower and do all these things before I left the house I would end up being like an hour or two late to college mm, mm. because I wasn't able to feel in control of things before I left, sure. if that makes sense. Um, it was a very stressful time. Well, I know that, you know, my personal experiences with mental health services like CAMS was, you know, I, I appreciated that, that that kind of service was there, but it wasn't... <laughs> I don't know if it is probably a combination of the two, but I, I wasn't entirely willing to sort of engage with the process. And a lot of the things that were suggested to me more along came, came the lines of these like set things and processes to go through when I'm feeling a certain emotion. So I would get lots of different sheets and... <laughs> methods and ways to deal with anxiety and panic and meltdowns but a lot of those ways that that those sort of mechanisms for dealing with my mental health tended to be require you to first know that you are feeling a certain way and (laughs) during my teenagehood um, around that sort of 13 14 age where where I got diagnosed with depression and anxiety i didn't i was like deep into my alexithymic haze like i i just didn't know what was going on at all i i felt so separated from my emotional brain that i i I felt like it was a different person like i had this kind of split in my brain and so it was it was really hard to manage mental health because of that and I also found it really difficult to to connect with the people that I was speaking to and to, you know, really emphasize the 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 severity of the emotions that I felt um around like indirect communication. I, I was very, very flat affect when I was younger. I hardly had any facial expressions. I didn't have a lot of vocal tonality at all. I was very monotone and it didn't really help me in terms of, I guess, emphasizing the level of, you know, depression that I was feeling at that time, which was was, was very sort of intense. 
I had a lot of experiences growing up um, around sort of bullying, online harassment, social isolation, rumors, things like that, which really fed into my anxiety. I was very paranoid about every stage of my, my day, whether it was getting on the bus, uh, I had some bullies on there, uh, whether it was during lunchtime, had some bullies there during classes, in some classes even. And uh, a, lot, a lot of the time was from me was spent trying to avoid those situations, avoid those people. Um, but I just couldn't. And over time, I you know, developed these mental health conditions. Um, the most prevalent ones at the time, other than that quite severe anxiety and depression, was uh, dissociation, which... You know, I now know is one of the brain's defense mechanisms to sort of shield you from feeling emotional distress and pain in the instant. A lot of depersonalization, which is not feeling like you are real. A lot of deal realization, feeling like life isn't real. And I developed a lot of weird ways of coping and understanding my own differences in comparison to other people. I developed some like heavy delusions about me being some otherworldly creature with a greater purpose and <laughs> you know feeling like I was this this kind of Einstein who, you know, I looked at other people, other kids sort of acting in the way that they did, but being very emotional, being very like driven instantaneously to things. And I was like kind of looking at them like I was living in a zoo. And the only places I really felt safe and heard was when I was talking to adults who I felt kind of gave me the space to talk and, and were interested in what I was saying. And, you know, for, for other time, the, the reason why Cam's picked, picked me up was because the people around me started to notice that I had some quite um, severe self-harming behavior on my wrists. I used to go to school wearing like a really long tube bandage. I used to, to wear that tube bandage even when I was swimming. And I used to, I was kind of going through like a very heavy emo phase around that time. So I wore a lot of wristbands if I wasn't wearing that bandage to kind of cover them up. And, you know, it, it generally got worse over time up until probably the age of 17. I I tried to take my life a couple of times. First through medication, and the second time through through cutting. And um I had to go to ER to get stitches. And I had a lot of sort of supports around me in terms of sort of monitoring my medication, making sure that I didn't have access to methods to do that. A lot of the time it was, you know, it was after school. I, I even sort of got to a point where I, my, my self-esteem was just so crushed by my experiences that I started developing things like uh, bulimia. And um, I, I became bulimic and I, I started to binge and purge because I just wasn't happy with how I looked who I was, I tried to offset my social difficulties by having a good body, which obviously didn't work. But there was a lot of things, I think, you know, on the way, which, you know, the, the, the combination of my environment, how I was feeling about myself, and also the supports not, not really being effective for me, all of those things sort of culminated in a very, very existential, nihilistic view of the world, which followed me even into my early 20s. There was a point at which I start, you know, lots of points where I started to change things around. I was, you know, focused on getting to university and I, I got into the place that I wanted to get in, doing biomedical sciences at Manchester, which was a really big achievement for me. And I also climbed quite highly in terms of taekwondo. Uh, in in terms of being an athlete, I competed for GB at a couple of events, and I kind of 
leaned on that as a way for me to in sort of build my own self-esteem up but as you know you know receiving awards and receiving congratulations and attention for that kind of thing it's 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 very limited in its like long-term effectiveness for dealing with that it has to be a lot you know looking back it's obviously very internal but just having these goals in my mind really kept me going sort of during those times Sorry, I just monologued for like ages, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. No, it's good. It's all about um personal experience. So yeah. Um you've saying about depersonalization. I experienced that um for the first time actually around two years ago, which was right. around the time that I well, it was my second time uh, being suicidal and attempting suicide. So my first suicide attempt was also um, an overdose of my yeah. antidepressants. Um, it didn't work. and I'm That must have been, like, hard. Like, so imagine, uh, I mean, I, I've accidentally took a, taken, like, a double dose of my antidepressants before, and it was so anxiety-provoking. It was horrendous. Like, <laughs> I remember, like, I was literally just crying and I felt like in a massive haze. I didn't understand what was going on. And then, yeah, I, I think I told my my mum and I was like, don't shout at me or get mad at me, but this is what I did. And I was crying and she was like, what? <laughs> and then I just went to hospital and then everything was okay because I didn't take enough to, like, damage anything or, like, kill myself so I was still there <laughs> and I'm happy I'm still here and I'm still there but then around like two years ago um I became increasingly unwell and I actually went off of my antidepressants during COVID which was probably mm. not an ideal time but I felt yeah. okay I felt fine and I said to my doctor I'd really like to get off them I feel like I will be okay so I went off them but then the pressures of my personal life and university and COVID yeah. all just merged together into this big like massive brick wall that just yeah. fell on top of me and I tried and I tried to just like cope I guess but I wasn't coping and what really um hit it all off me was going back to study face-to-face -face at university because I sure. studied at Leeds Beckett University which is like a good three hours away from where mm -hmm. I live <laughs> so um yeah and I, I remember saying um I don't want to go I'd rather just finish it at home because I knew in my gut I shouldn't go but everyone kept saying to me and I know it was out of their best interests that um you know, it'd be good for you. You should do it. It's your last year. <laughs> You'll have a good time. And I was like... Some neurotypical advice. Like. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't listen to myself and I should have. And then I took everyone's advice. I moved back to uni. And by two months later in October, I was done. Um, mm. I was already like really depressed, really ill. And I was just crying. I got even worse. I was like really anxious and increasingly suicidal. Like, I would have yeah. probably ended my life if I stayed there. So um, I remember coming home in, like, November for the last time before. I didn't go back after that. And my grandma also passed away at the time. Um, just a it lot of things happened. Yeah. yeah, many things. And there was a lot of grief. Um, and then I felt bad because I was unwell <laughs> during the time that everyone was meant to be grieving so I felt like a complete burden because of that as well um that's that's a really sort of key part of it isn't it because when you when you have mental health conditions it's you know it's obvious it's an illness and it, it does you know it's not just a mental psychological thing it, it changes the chemistry of your brain and even to some degree, like the physicality of it over over the long term, and it's it's hard when you're feeling so bad and you're looking at other people's lives where there's things, you know, objectively horrible, negative things that are happening to other people, and then you kind of look at yourself and you're like, oh, why am I 
feeling so bad about where I am now. Like I've got so many good things going for me. There's no reason that I should feel like this. And you give yourself a really hard time about it as well, don't you? Definitely agree. Um, I tend to put a lot of pressure on mm. on ourselves. Um, I definitely do. Not feeling like I'm good enough. I, I always had a like innate feeling that I was never good enough and I'll never be good enough. Um, mm. And lots of self-doubt as well. So I struggle a lot with that. Um, and my dissertation, for example... I couldn't complete it and I completed everything else from my final year. So I couldn't graduate with my honours. And then through my process of recovery from an eating disorder <laughs> and mental illness and general suicidal thoughts and feelings, I managed to complete it, <laughs> which is really good, which means I can now wow. graduate with my honours. Um, and it was like a, I had to carry on as a continuing student for a year more. But I'll be graduating this year and I'm happy um but Great. yeah thank you I do remember them um before because I went into a hospital a mental health hospital mm. um like well, like a ger- like a psychiatric thing. psychiatric inpatient like thing sort of yeah yeah for men- mentally unstable people but luckily I wasn't admitting so I went in there but I was like assessed and I was there for like a whole day and then okay. I remember just saying, I don't want to be him. I'm not going to be yeah. him. I'm not staying here. And I was like, I want to go home. And they deemed me unfit to go home. But because I had so much f- familial support around me, they let me go home. Good, um, good. Thank God, because right. I don't think I would have <laughs> yeah. been okay there. <laughs> So I, I'm just looking back at like the event, the EDA, EDA event. Like there was so many people talking about just yeah. the horrific experiences that they had in psychiatric inpatient. Even with, um, I think you might have seen uh, Lauren Bridges' story. Yeah. Like uh, she's talking about. Wait, have I got the right name? I'm just checking. No problem. No, the Lauren Bridges' story about being in inpatient units uh her mother lindsay bridges was was talking about that sort of experience and like they went to like courts and stuff and they had to even even though they got approved that this hospital wasn't fit for her they still wouldn't let let her out and there was no like accountability around it and stuff and i think there's like a statistic of of about like two thousand people two thousand autistic people uh, being sort of in inpatient units in the UK, which is really concerning. <laughs> it is, yeah, very disheartening as well. Because the, those conditions are not like are not good for autistic people, and no. I, I think for the entirety that Lauren was at that hospital, they didn't have any therapy, any supports, or anything like that. It was just lock them up and give them food and try and keep them safe but they didn't even do that job which is the sort of tragic part of it it really is it's heartbreaking because you're put into a place that's meant to keep you safe and secure and look after you but if you really think about it putting an autistic person in a place where they're not even supposed to be in the first place and not letting Mm. them leave or see their family is going to drive them to basically the end of like yeah yeah where they could be so yeah i'm I'm very glad that i didn't have to stay in hospital mm-hmm. but yeah i did have like nurses come out to me though mental health nurses and i went to all my doctor's appointments mm-hmm. and dietitian and stuff like that because i was literally skin and bones <laughs> i'm already petite as i am but I lost a lot of weight and I've just managed to regain weight again, which I'm very happy about. Congrats. Thank you. Um, I was I was feeling quite down about it, but I couldn't make myself eat. I don't even know. I was on 40 juice for mm. like a month um, and then What's like that? a long time afterwards. Um, it's like a supplement of like nutrients and stuff. So they also have 40 sip as well. So it like replenishes mm. your body with things that you're not getting because you're not eating food. Yeah, and because I was in such a bad state, I remember saying to my my parents, "Well, 
if I don't eat, then that means I don't have to take my medication and that means I no longer have to be here. I don't have to be alive anymore. And then, like, that's a really horrible thing to say, but it's just how I was feeling. So, I think yeah. a, lot, a, lot, a lot of my experiences, particularly in, in early adulthood, were it was kind of along those lines of, like, I... I wasn't, I was trying very hard not to like do something that would just end it. But at the same time, I wasn't taking care of myself in the, with the purpose of, you know, achieving something like that. Like I, I would, you know, go to sleep e each night, you know, hoping that I didn't wake up and I would start doing very silly, stupid things like crossing roads without looking a lot of d different things like that to 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 somewhat you know contribute to me not having a long life which you know obviously it's it's not something that that was effective or wanted or or good there was one situation which was kind of my resurgence of my mental health in my second year at university it's actually the time that i met my best friend um kate um who's you know really integral for me you know finding a support network and finding friends at university she was also going through her own you know mental health stuff and we i i, I actually <laughs> it was a situation i was living with someone that i lived in first year with and i was kind of i was, at, I was kind of getting to the point where this person was very they were kind of tired of me like they, they they cared about me but they were tired of me and it was you know i was in a situation where i hadn't gone outside for a couple of months other than to get very unhealthy snacks and food from like the local shop i basically became like a hermit for like a, a portion of my life becoming very paranoid, very depressed, you know, having about five or six panic attacks a day, even though I wasn't outside or doing anything, binging, purging a lot. It was, it was, it was kind of a time that it, it culminated. And before then, before I went to university and sort of reached the age of 18, I was very against things like alcohol. But uh, during those times, I was sort of drinking quite a lot in the in that second year. Um, I used to like sit on my my couch in the in the living room, sort of drinking alcohol and watching Rick and Morty, which was kind of like the first, I guess one of the first times that it came out. I can't, I can't remember how long that was ago. <laughs> it was a while. <laughs> but it's a good I, show. I, I got to, yeah, it's it was it was great. <laughs> And Bojack Horseman, and those were kind of my the the two shows that really struck a chord with me because I was I always have been and always you know and I still am very existential in how I view life and um, I had lots of different existential crises where I didn't think any, anything was real. I was like that philosopher who kind of sat by and watched the world go and not really cared about himself and just. You know, thought that everything was an illusion. I was like that for for a, a good few months, and it it got to a point at which I drastically came off my medication. One of it's kind of a strange thing because it's not something that you can really put your finger on when when you stop medication as a like a it's more like a gradual build up of mental health i think one of the reasons why i stopped is because you know being on ssris you kind of you know, ssris work by dampening your emotions they don't raise your overall happiness they don't like make the the dips less like flatten out the dips and make you more positive it, it flattens it out from both sides and i i i, I just missed feeling happy and positive about things and when i came off when i have come off the medications 
I had more instances where I could feel, you know, genuinely more like myself, generally more happy, more positive and experience those, those highs of life. Um, but I, I also experienced a lot of the lows in equal measures and in probably even more so, which led me to a point where I got into crisis mode. I was taking, I was on a medication of, uh, Benzodiazepines, quadiazepam. I've been on that. <laughs> this is great for anxiety, but I was on a very heavy regimen of it. And so I had a lot of tablets. And there was this point where I didn't feel safe. And it was kind of this culminating thing. And I I, I I'm not gonna lie, you know, I I was scared about dying. I was I was scared about that, but I was also, you know at such a crisis point that I felt that it was less scary than sort of continuing to go on with life. And so I, I drank a lot. I took a lot of these tablets and I sort of continued to do that over the course of a few hours. I got to a point where I was like, Hey, look, I'm not in a good state. And so I took this self trip. I started walking around with my alcohol and my, 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 I think there were beta blockers actually, propanolol, and I st I started walking around taking these these medications and and drinking, and I went to one of these crisis homes, and that was my that was my goal to like admit me to this crisis home. But this place was not open, and so I continued walking around and going into the parks and just crying and getting upset and and continuing down this this rabbit hole and eventually I got home because I'd had all of the medication that I had and I, I went to get another one thankfully you know I talked to my friend Kate about it beforehand that I was not feeling in the best way and that I was feeling quite suicidal and she was worried about me and I wasn't replying to her so she called like the the flat services, like the student accommodation services to come and check on me. Um, it was at a point where it was kind of, you know, if I, if I had continued in that, that state, I don't know what would have happened. I, I can't imagine that it would, would have been good. And they took me to hospital. It was a very long night. I didn't sleep the entire night. I was there with these white fluorescent lights and doctors trying to like hold me down to get like a blood blood sample to make sure I was okay. And I remember sort of getting out in the morning, probably about seven or eight AM. And they gave me like a heavy dose of, uh, uh, of an actual benzo to sort of smooth out my, my anxiety from the nights. And that was the experience. And, uh, I was very annoyed at my friend Kate for a long time. I was very like, you know, I could have done it then. And I was, you know, I was, sort of a bit a bit like you know you took this from me and you know I, I nearly did it and it was something that you know I'd been thinking about for over 10 or 11 years and this was kind of the the breaking point I was like look I'm not gonna go any longer and and she stopped me so I had to sort of process that in my own time obviously looking back on things I'm I mean eternally grateful to her and it, 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 I did have resurgences of mental health but I think the the turning point for everything was when my my granddad passed who I was very close to he died of uh, lung cancer uh, it was a very long process and it happened when I was abroad in Thailand studying mosquitoes and doing research on them and I couldn't go back to see him. And um, I, I thought about that a lot. And, you know, I kind of said to myself at that point that I wouldn't try again. And um, I didn't. And I had very much in my head all the time that I was, you know, ever since that that point where I was in second year at uni in that, in that situation, you know, that, that was kind of a turning point for me. And I, I realized that you know, it, although 
you know, my pain wasn't alleviated and it wasn't going to go anywhere anytime soon. It was, I guess, illuminating to me that all of these experiences after, after the fact were, you know, I, I wouldn't have known about it. I would never have experienced it and I've never have gone to Thailand and had all these crazy experiences. And I think just over time, refocusing myself on trying to support others who are going through the same thing was something that really meant a lot to me. And it's kind of pulled me through a lot of difficult times that I, I still have with life. It's not, it's not like it's gone away. It's just, you know, over time, my mindset's changed on it and the way that I manage it is, is, is a lot better than, than what it used to be. That was, that was my second experience with it. I haven't thankfully had any more like that. I'm glad to hear that you haven't had any more. Yeah. It sound, sounds like it was a very difficult time to go through. I mean, it it, it is, but it, I think, you know, looking back on it, people always think of these moments of being like, you know, in my head, it was kind of this movie, movie like moment where, you know, life had got too hard for this autistic man and everything was going to end. And when it didn't happen like that, I kind of, you know, looked at myself and I was like, what, what the hell am I doing? And, you know, it's not going to go like that. I'm not going to make like head headlines and people are going to talk about how awful this is and it's going to change the world or anything like i actually have to do things to make a difference rather than just do that and that was quite illuminating for me that makes sense well um i do I, do you have any anything else to add about your own experience it's fine if not <laughs> I know that again, I've just monologued for ages at you, so <laughs> No, it's fine, don't worry. It's all about talking about your own experience, so you know. And you're not just monologuing at me, it's everyone who's gonna listen as well. So Yep, sorry everybody. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was like what I meant. You okay. So you know I know what you mean. I know. I know. You mean, yeah. Hey up. Just popping on to say thank you for listening to this podcast this far. If you could do me a real solid, please make sure to rate the podcast if you're on a podcasting streaming service and do all that like, subscribe, comment stuff on YouTube. Damn, even send a heart in the comments if you don't feel like typing. Make sure to check out my link tree, which is always down below in the description, or head over to my Instagram page at Thomas Henley UK for daily blogs, podcast updates, and weekly lives. This podcast is sponsored by my favorite noise cancelling, noise reducing earbuds that you can adjust the volume on. Really, really great thing. They're called D Buds, and you can find the affiliate link down in the description of this podcast. Anyway, I hope you enjoy the rest of the podcast. That's all from me. Yeah, I think for me, I'd just say, um, uh... Support is important, having good support around you. And I think that's what's definitely helped me and kept me going. Yeah. And so I, I suppose we've I suppose we talked about like the negative side of things, but you know, if we if we kind of shift away from sort of our personal experiences that might be, you know, I suppose it would be good to talk about like the the positive experiences with mental health. Have you have you experienced any of those? What if you can think of people or services or things that have been the most transformative for you, what would those be? Um, I definitely think my dad. Um, mm -hmm. My dad's always been like a really awesome person in my life and I just love him so much. He's just always cared for me unconditionally, um, loved me. And Parents are so important. Like, yeah. I really feel for people who don't have that. It's me it's too. hard. And he always always he never made me feel bad about anything. So for example, when I was like having ridiculous amounts of showers, um mm -hmm. <laughs> and like making the bathroom like really steamy and stuff and yeah. <laughs> just I don't know, just loads of like silly things. Um my dad wasn't concerned about that. He was more concerned about me and about mm. my health and my mental well-being and emotional well-being 
um, rather, rather than, than the water bill. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. He, d- he wasn't concerned about the water bill at all. And I'm telling you, I used to shower. This is crazy, I know, but it was where my mind was. Apparently, it was going to make me feel better. Um, I used to shower like multiple times a day for like ages for like an hour wow. each time was not the and I spent most of my life in the shower so um yeah. yeah it was a stressful time and it was so bad but I'm really glad because now I'm doing much better with with that and many other things as well yeah so definitely I think having people who can support you and look after you and love you unconditionally is really important and my siblings have helped me a lot. I love my siblings so much. Um, they all look after me still and take care of me. And they're very accepting and um, open uh, with my with my autism as well. And some other mm. members of my family are neurodivergent too. So it just makes it, you know, easier. Yeah. And yeah. my my cats as well. <laughs> my yeah. cats have been an amazing support. And my cat Angel actually was one of the reasons why I didn't kill myself like two years ago. So yeah, pets are really, really, really important. They're just so special because she was really depressed when I was depressed. <laughs> um, mm. When I was leaving for uni and coming back and she actually got like cystitis and she actually had depression because I wasn't there and because I was ill. So she's much better now because I'm better and she helped me get better and I helped her get better. So I'm it kind of animals kind of help you view things from a bit more of like a realistic standpoint when you're like off in your head about issues that you're having you know animals are kind of there just living in the moment just like you know there for you just you know <laughs> there's no no judgment no judgment yeah they always listen. I don't know if they understand, but they always listen and they always like yeah. feel your emotions. So they take care yeah. of you. Yeah. I think I think for me in terms of things that have made a positive impact, I would definitely say my family, particularly my mom, was amazing. They didn't really understand much of it when I was younger, but I when I got into my early twenties I started to be a bit more clear about it. You know, I came out about my self harming. Um, I came out about my depression, my issues with alcohol. And so I, I started to become a lot more, you know, my, my, my family were, were, were amazing for supporting me through these times when I couldn't function and when I couldn't, you know, do stuff like make myself food or, or, you know, to keep on top of hygiene or, um, get myself on track with things. <laughs> Cat's just, uh, chilling over there. She is. She's like, hi guys. <laughs> and. But you know, I I I haven't really had the best experience with the mental health system, and I wish I could say that, hey, look, this is the the path to take because I just don't think that the mental health systems are good for autistic people at the moment. At least, I'm sure there are some great ones out there, but there were none that I could really find in my area. None that I could really find that were part of like the general health care that we have in the UK. So I, 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 I all around, you know, was in and out of these situations and obviously having a lot of medication, which I suppose is another thing that helped me a lot. Something that, you know, a lot of people these days like to push aside and they're saying, oh, everyone's getting, you know, medicated and things like that. But it really did save my life for a, a lot of the time. And the times when I, that I wasn't on these medications, the times that I really struggled. Um, and had these these experiences, so it's those things, and and also I think for me personally, growing and learning more about autism was definitely a a really big life changing thing for me. Things like alexithymia, finally understanding why I I just couldn't connect with my emotions and trying to find ways to get around that, and notice when my mental health was getting bad. That was such a massive thing for me talking to and listening to other people within the autistic community was was really helpful for me as well and there's been there's been people throughout my life who have been advocates and supporters and 
you know, really have my best intentions at heart and help me. Whether it was at university, there's this amazing student support officer that I used to go to when I was not feeling good. In my workplace, you know, I have someone who was originally a work coach for me, who's now my friend, and she really supports and advocates me and, and advocates for me in different situations at work. So I guess, like, you know, the most important for me, people for me outside of family are just people, like people who are open-minded, wanted to listen and cared about me. And I could, I could feel that. That, that was the most, the, those are the most important things for me in terms of mental health, but also finding a meaning and I guess understanding more about where I wanted to be in life and who I wanted to be and aligning that more with possibilities like you know i'm not, I'm not going to become this this completely different person but i can become like a better version of myself and having a meaning for me of of wanting to help people wanting to share my message i think has been the biggest sort of driver for me even through situations where i'm feeling very depressed and it's not always easy and sometimes i do need to let people know to keep an eye on me but overall, it's it has been getting easy to manage as as I've got older. That's a good thing. Yeah, a really good thing. <laughs> One thing that I want to ask is, you know, because things like suicide carries a lot of stigma behind it, and you even have a lot of people kind of shaming people who have committed suicide or think about suicide as being weak or not caring about the people around them. <laughs> Those are just a few, obviously, but what what are kind of the common misconceptions of stigma that you've heard around suicide? I definitely think being weak, <laughs> that's a really mm. huge one. Um because actually I don't think it's not a weak thing to go through with it at all. No, and nobody who's <laughs> experienced that yeah, will that, say that, that other people are weak. <laughs> like it's it's, it's no. not an easy easy thing to deal with in life it's it's the opposite not at all and another thing is um from personal experience and i think hearing other people's stories and uh research and stuff um the reason why people decide or choose to end their life by suicide or attempt to do that is because they are trying to run away from something but yeah. it's not an external thing it's internal and they simply cannot get away from it so the feelings are very strong and the only way that you can think of getting away from it is probably sleep but you can't sleep forever because you have to wake back up yeah so exactly that's that's another thing that i used to exactly. do a lot me too just get, get away to from sleep, to sleep stay asleep <laughs> yeah I'd sleeping in yeah, I'm not dealing with the world today. Um, actually, when you're depressed, that's why you can either become like an insomniac because you're too stressed mm. and thinking that you can't sleep or you just sleep forever. But yeah. I've done both. But I I do think like the dark darkness of your thoughts um, just mm. can become a bit too much. Yeah, and it just feels like a, a natural and easy option and route to take you know like you just won't have to deal with any of the worldly stuff again and it, to be fair I, where, where you go we don't know properly um mm. but i don't know whatever it is surely can't be worse than this is what what it feels yeah. like but yeah that's what I think, I think i think there's a there's a big stigma around um suicide being selfish that it's something that you know, people are like, oh, you're going to affect the people around you. And yeah, it is true. Like, people are going to have to mourn you and grieve. And, you know, it's it's not an easy thing for a social network to, for anyone that knows you to to deal with or hear about. But there, there is also an aspect that, you know, it's not very easily put into words that, that most people could understand. But... A lot of people who choose to do, who choose to take their life, it's not something that is a is is often like a, a selfish thing. For a lot of people, they can feel like they're a burden. 
especially yes. if it's a long-term mental health condition. And they feel like they're actually, just by being there, they are reducing the mood, depressing other people around them, that they're causing issues for people around them and that they are the problem in, in a certain family system or a certain social, social network. And so they feel that it's it's genuinely something that will help other people around them and that it's a good thing and that them being there is a bad thing. And it's not easily, uh, I guess, relatable to a lot of people, but when you are in the midst of that really severe period where, you know, you are contemplating that a lot, it's, it is very apparent. You don't, you don't care about yourself at all and you feel very much like, you know, it, it, things would be better if you weren't there. Um, it it's hard so, for people to understand. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And in a way, it sort of feels like you're doing everyone else a favour by exactly. not being there. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I totally understand that and agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, and another thing I think is people, uh, maybe like sometimes people might be driven towards suicide because, and like us, we do have some good support systems in place. People who don't have support systems in place mm -hmm. may be more likely to go towards that route, mm -hmm. which is a shame. I think as well, yeah. if, if you're not diagnosed autistic as well, I think that's a massive like oh part of God. the puzzle. <laughs> it is. You know, uh, I saw this, this crazy like statistic on like how many people in the UK could be undiagnosed <laughs> like autistic so for like in the hundreds of thousands kind of range which is absolutely mad you see so many like there's this tiktok that i'm gonna sort of critique and put out a bit later because it's just absurd it's like this lady going off about how everyone's getting diagnosed autistic these days and that they're faking it and you know they're trying to get attention and find this 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 cool hip identity for them my god like they they just really just don't understand. Just because of like the stigmas around autism, they feel like it's something just so out of the box um, to assume. But it's it's I think it's true. You know, um, I don't think it's just from my personal experiences. I, you know, I see a lot more than two percent of the population in my daily life. Which me too. You know, like I sometimes go out and I think, oh, that person, I feel like they could be autistic. <laughs> you get the you get yeah. the spectrum there going off. Yeah. You do, <laughs> you're spectrum. like, ooh. Um and they might not even know it either. So and at one point you yeah. didn't know it. Yeah, yeah. It's really really Yeah, yeah, it's it's gotta be weird on that. I mean there's 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 so many like stigmas from mental health and from autism you have that like that andrew tate guy going around saying that depression doesn't isn't real and that and other conspiracy theorists saying that medication is a way to keep you depressed so that you can you know <laughs> you have all this this stuff online and all of these people giving their thoughts on something that they've never experienced just spouting absolute nonsense and it can be really hard to live in a world that kind of pretty much negates or, or tries to dismiss your experiences of life as something that's a personality trait, something that, exactly. you know, you're an anxious person, you're a negative person. And because you're an anxious and negative person, you have anxiety and depression. It's not like that. Not uh, the, most po <laughs> the most positive, the most like loving, empathic and strong people I know They've been through mental health conditions, really severe ones or really hard life experiences and develop those conditions from it. Like it's not something that's that that's a personality trait. Anyone can be can become a depressed. It just, you know, for some people, it's a lot more common. Especially for autistic people. I agree with you hundred percent. I do think as well with depression, it has a lot to do with like trauma and like mm. unresolved trauma so healing your inner child and trauma related um things i think is yeah. very beneficial 
Yeah. Well, PTSD and, and CPTSD is quite common for autistic people as well. There's, well everything is more common for us. <clears throat> I know. We're just, you know, we're magnets for everything. <laughs> but, but I don't think that's because of us being autistic. I think it's our experiences. It's yes. <clears throat> the neurotypical world, as you said, you know. I am, um, because personally, I go to therapy weekly and private mm-hmm. therapy. Again, because Good. the mental health system <laughs> doesn't provide a great mm-hmm. mental health support. Thank you. Um, but it's so beneficial for me because I've I've learned so much from it about myself and healing myself. And I've become my more authentic autistic self as well since I've been in this therapy. So I'm happy. <laughs> Brilliant. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, I suppose the last last question that I wanted to cover before we try and wrap things up. So we, we've identified this big mental health crisis in the autistic community. We know that suicidality is very high for us, uh, along with lots of different other things that, and and life quality statistics that that really make it hard to live as an autistic person. How do you think we can we can better address? Um, and support others in the autistic community who who have these experiences? I definitely think recognising that autism isn't a deficit would be Mm. a really good thing because for me, as soon as I disclose to somebody that I'm autistic, their perception of me changes completely and um, it makes me sad and it sometimes makes me wonder whether I should tell people at all that I'm I'm happy and I'm proud to be autistic because it is who I am. Um, and I think along with that, once you tell someone, comes infantilization. So people will just automatically start treating you like a kid, like a little child. Yeah. You're not a child. You're a fully grown adult who's aware of, like, everything and you know you're autistic. Um if anything, we're just more in touch with our inner child <laughs> and it's it's cool, it's fun. Um, we're not appalled think... to those social norms that keep us from acting in a certain way. Or like... Exactly. <laughs> like, I, I just do things because I want to do them. Um, mm. Like, for example, my special interests are dinosaurs. <laughs> so ju- nice. everything to do with Jurassic nice. Park, <laughs> thank you, nice. and Jurassic World. And usually that's just associated with children or young boys, for example. Mm. And I'm an adult female who's 25 and I still love dinosaurs and Jurassic and I love dressing up in different cosplay um, and also Batman as well. I'm completely obsessed with Batman and Gotham. But sometimes people can see it as like childish. Is that childish? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's pretty cool. But um, yeah. yeah, I definitely think infantilization is one of the worst things that... I experience still and I have experienced because autistic people are actually super, super smart. Mm. <laughs> and I'm not saying that because I'm autistic and I'm smart. You're smart. Loads of autistic. I think it's actually proven, isn't it? Like autistic people actually have uh, really average high or above IQs. average. Yeah. Average really or high above IQ. average IQ. Mm. So if anything, we're less childlike. We're so smart. I literally did my dissertation in four days. Like that's insane. <laughs> I can't believe that. Well, it's 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 weird, isn't it? Because when we're younger, we get classified as like little professors, yeah, and we talk to like adults and stuff. But when we get to adulthood, we get characterized as like this immature, childish character. Like so just, weird. Just... <laughs> yeah. Odd it's, it's... indeed. It's like two ends of the extreme. It's Where's the middle? <laughs> is there yeah. a middle? I don't think there is. But instead of accepting us for how we are, people just like, mm. I don't know, always make us feel weird. seen that because you? you feel able to break out of the social norms and barrier, social barriers that people enforce for no reason, that <laughs> that, that makes you a child. Whereas, you know, if you talk to a lot of neurotypicals that there'll be a lot of things that they really enjoy that they've they've been like oh well i've grown out of it and things like that i'm like have you grown out of it or are you just trying to conform because 
people might think it's a bit strange that you like Starlight Pokemon or like, <laughs> exactly. you know. It's nothing to be ashamed of. You should be proud of your interests and your likes and, and your dislikes. You know, mm. everyone's different. Yeah, I think it's important to just acceptance. <laughs> acceptance mm. like if people could just be more accepting it would be fantastic i think as far as things that i would you know i think could be better addressed within the autistic community or or just in the widespread widespread mainstream i think there really needs to be a distinction between low quality of life and being autistic because a lot of people in their heads they immediately think with any disability that by having that disability, you're going to have a low quality of life. Um, and it's kind of part and part of the same thing. You know, you're disabled, of course, you're going to have a low quality of life. And I think we really need to try and make that distinction a bit more clear because I'm not fully convinced that being autistic makes you have a bad life. I know a lot of people who have had really great lives and they haven't had all this trauma. They're autistic, they do great, they're amazing. They have social networks, they have friends that, you know, they have a relationship, they're in a work, work place that they enjoy, they go traveling. They do all of these amazing things. But again, it's like, it's the environment. It's we're not in a place in society where education, the workplace, the media is an inclusive space. And that people understand us. And I think... I think that's a really, really important key point. I think also, you know, I think there is a there is a barrier to talking about these really important things, being that social media isn't always like always the most happy to, you know, encourage dialogue about things that are not positive, you know. Some things, <laughs> if you were to talk about, you know, like, for example, with this podcast, I'm not going to be able to make any reels out of it because I know that it's just not going to work. Um, yeah. Social media is not going to push them out. It's not going to be a message that a lot of people hear. It's just part and part because, you know, social media is not designed for that. And we're, we're all kind of kept safe with the, within this algorithm so that we can't hear about this stuff. Kept safe. Like a bubble. <laughs> Like a bubble, yeah. It's um I mean it's not like it's gonna it would be removed, but it's definitely not gonna be promoted. And it's, you know, even with this podcast episode, I imagine that, you know, just part and part the 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 naming of it, it's not gonna get out to a lot of people. Which is the the unfortunate side of it. I think as well we need to do a lot of work specifically around men. I think there is a very heavy tendency for guys to adopt this kind of very strong mindset of I'm not emotional, I am strong, I can deal with everything. Mental health doesn't exist, I'm just being weak. I think that that mindset for a lot of men is quite prevalent and I'd really like to challenge that I think because I don't think being open and vulnerable is a is a is a level of weakness but I do think experiencing negative things about life and trying to find ways to phrase it or hide it is a sign of weakness. I think that that mindset really needs to change a lot because just being open and just being or acknowledging certain feelings, certain experiences, you know, that is a strength in its own and it requires a lot of strength of moral character and, you know, strength, strength in you know, to, to share that stuff. I don't think that it's it's a negative thing. Um, sure, there'll be toxic people around you, perhaps, you know, and there have been in, in my life who sort of ridicule you and, and you know, say that you're, you're feminine or you're too emotionally open and they sort of make fun of you. I've had a few guys like that in my life. Um, but, you know, the majority of them, I think, a lot of them, a lot of men, they they do want to talk about this stuff, but it's, you know, it's because of the, the current social climate, I think it's becoming a lot harder. And um, male suicide is, is a real big issue, even outside of the autistic community. 
And I wish that's something that could be changed, but I think that requires a lot of work, a lot of shifting the narrative and the frameworks that we have. I agree with you um, a thousand percent. It's one of the things that I'm actually very passionate about as well, um, because I understand that men are more likely to end their life by suicide, which is really, really sad. Um, it's the it's, leading cause of male death in young to mid age. The leading cause. <laughs> so horrible, and it's like it's that toxic masculinity sort of thing, isn't it? Um, where like like you said, I I think it's strength. Like I think it's such strength to show that um, mm. you have emotions and you're feeling them, and if you don't feel good, you're gonna talk about it or you're gonna do whatever you can. That's a healthy way to feel better but like you said I don't think it's good to bottle it all up or do other things to compensate for like feeling bad emotions because if you think about it feeling not so good emotions isn't a bad thing because if you weren't able to feel them then you wouldn't feel the good ones would you so no. it balances well, you'd it be out. a psychopath like men are <laughs> yeah. not supposed to be psychopaths that's not what we're trying to exactly. we're reach for <laughs> you it to be emotionless feeling emotion feeling emotion is not a feminine thing it's a human thing everyone yes. feels emotions exactly you know even the most masculine men they feel very strong emotions towards their kids and their their family and like you know it's it's not something that's a you know has to be characterized as a weak thing just because you're acknowledging that you have emotions. It's and when people think about this, they always think about, oh, right, oh, you think about all those men who get upset and start crying and 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 going on about their experiences. Well, you, you, it doesn't necessarily have to be like that. It could be as simple as just telling someone that you're not doing great, or telling someone about your experience with something. Like 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 we have been doing, you know, it's doesn't necessarily have to be this over the top emotional experience. It could just be acknowledging things and talking and trying to process how you're feeling. I think there's a really big roadblock there, but I'd I'd really highlight that as something else. There is also another aspect of that, and just from from my personal experience and talking to other men it doesn't necessarily have to be something that is caused by other men i think in my life a lot of people have even a lot of women have assumed that i'm okay i'm okay because i'm you know six free and and strong and you know i do all of this stuff and so there's no possibility that i would need any any support or emotional um, supportive issues that I have and you know that that that's been sort of a constant for me I think to be honest that uh, from my experiences you know I've had more you know validating comments and validating responses from from other men um, in my time I don't know whether that's just because of my physicality or the way that I am but it's definitely an experience that I've had um, a lot in my life and um, I've always tried to support people and try to help them through their own emotions and experiences. But a lot of the time when I sort of turn the turn the spotlight to myself and, you know, ask for support or tell people about my experiences, it's often it's often very much kind of pushed aside when I've done that. I don't know what that what that says, but I thought it was just worth mentioning because I, I I do think that it's not necessarily something that's always pushed by men. I think it's a general sort of societal thing. And when you see someone like myself, who's, as I said, you know, quite externally, quite masculine, I think a lot of people can make assumptions that, you know, I'll, I'll be a certain way or that I can't feel emotions, which is, um, has been, you know, very unfortunate for me in a number of circumstances. So that's that's all that I wanted to to mention. Um, was there anything else that you'd, you you think that would be good to address before we try and wrap things up? Um, 
I just think ableism in general. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's such a big like thing, but yeah, there's just ableist attitudes just embedded in society and its systems. So, you know, we we've just got to try as much as we can to not eradicate because we won't be able to, but to like lessen the the effects of it on people. Um Sure. And like you said, promote the the positives of like people who have disabilities because mm. people mm. with disabilities are not less fun. <laughs> um, yeah. We um, are awesome. <laughs> We're fantastic. And we have lots to offer, lots of creativity as well, which is really cool. And yeah, the final thing I'll say, I'd say is it's hard to unmask and it's hard to be authentic. Um in our world but it feels fantastic so you know if you can and um, if you feel comfortable enough to do it and if you can't do it around everyone just whoever you can unmask around or with you know do it with them and family and friends that are important to you because they're so important but yeah that's all that's all I have to say great that you highlighted the unmasking part it's um I think you are definitely right with that. It it can put it put a big roadblock in all areas of your life when you do that. And um also knowing when and where to do it and when you when where it's safe to do it as well. Cause I think it's all good in saying like unmask everywhere and do all of these things, but you know, that that's that's assuming that your environment's always gonna be totally hundred percent positive and respectful which is not the case in a lot of circumstances. No, unfortunately. <laughs> well, 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 we'll hopefully change that in the, in the sort of coming years. Hopefully neurodiversity will kick off and well. we'll start getting a bit more mainstream attention and start improving things a bit more, making life easier for, for autistic people. Yeah, so uh, it's coming to the point in the podcast where I would usually do song of the day do you have your song of the day or do you want some time to think about it can I have some time yeah you can yeah, it's fine <laughs> let me look on my Spotify what have I been listening to I definitely do have songs because all I do is keep my headphones on me too as fun as, fun as talking about negative horrible things to be honest it is a bit weird like because because of my, because of being alexithymic I can talk about things that are really depressing and horrible <laughs> very easily without it kind of affecting my mental state in the in the moment i so think like, i experienced that too because i talk about it yeah. with like smiles <laughs> or like yeah cheeriness but it's not because i'm happy about it it's just you know what i mean <laughs> yeah you feel kind of a t detached a little bit detached emotionally from like the emotions for me tend to come like after or like a few days after when I kind of reflect on it and you know and I'm in a situation where I'm feeling quite sad anyway and I kind of think about it again I'm like oh yeah damn like and it feels worse <laughs> yeah <laughs> that happens sometimes. to me yeah because I remember I had to send my letters from the hospital for evidence for mitigation for my dissertation and when yeah, I was yeah, taking yeah. I was taking pictures of them and I was reading them and trying not to read them. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'm fine. A few days later, I was not fine. I was completely depressed. And I was like, what the hell? And it's because I'd read everything that had happened during that time. And it's traumatic. Mm. But, you know, it is what it is. And I stayed depressed for a few days. And then I went to, there's a place called the Sanctuary Cafe in Wolverhampton. Um, mm. And I go there quite often if I'm not feeling good. And you just get to talk to someone and just sit and chill and have coffee. It's nice. That's safe great. I need Thank more you. of those around yeah, the country. Definitely. I've got my, my song of the day. It, because I went to a Dermot Kennedy it. concert. So yeah. Um Hit me. Yeah, my song of the day is Homeward by Dermot Kennedy. So nice. And why have you picked this song? Um I picked this song because Thursday last week I actually went to see Dermot Kennedy live in Birmingham in the I think it was a oh for NEC um and I just thought it was such a beautiful song because it just highlights how you're not alone and someone 
someone is there for you and can be and will be there for you and you can also do that for someone else so homeward 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 <laughs> wait homeward is, is that how you spell homeward oh, yeah God. i don't even know like it was an actual like word homeward. Until... it looks like homeward homeward if that is true it does it's a lovely song. So that will be added to the song of the day playlist. I should really I should really turn it around and call it song of the week because it's a weekly podcast. I don't know why I've called it song of the day. It Maybe because of... it's it's the song on the day of the podcast. Yeah. What if you called it song of the day of the week of the podcast? <laughs> I'm joking. That's <laughs> so long. That's a twister. Yeah. So that is always as usual down in the description. You might have scrolled down to the bottom to check it out. There's about 23 songs so far of different uh, guests that I've had on sharing their own songs that that have some meaning to the topic of the podcast or some sort of deeper meaning to themselves or something that they just like um, or their own personal music. Um, so if you want to go check that out, that is the bottom of the description on YouTube and bottom of the description and pretty much anywhere else. You can check that out. So yeah, Hina, do you want to, do you have any links that you want to share or anything? You don't have to if you don't want to, but. Um, I don't know if I have any links. <laughs> um, okay. I just follow like a lot of pages on Instagram. I can't remember them all off the top of my head, but obviously one of them is yours because <laughs> it was like literally yeah. one of my favorite pages. Um, I think Autistic Callum as well. Autie now. Yeah, he's great. Um, neurodivergent Lou. Um, but I follow loads of auti- autism ones. So autism support community. I don't know. They're all just like uh, I love Brian. Yeah, they're all related to autism, and I follow loads um, of pages to do with mental health as well. Very cool. Thank awesome. you. Well, um, if you have enjoyed this episode, please make sure to like and comments if you're on YouTube, even if it's just a heart, just to let me know that you got to this point. Or if you are on one of the other podcasting streaming services like um, Spotify, please make sure to give it a rate, preferably the five star variety. Let me know your thoughts. And um, yeah, if you want to stay up to date with my work, the type of content I do, I do daily blogs on Instagram. Uh, you can find that at Thomas Henley UK. You'll also be able to see podcast updates, reels, and also clips over on YouTube, which is the name of the podcast if you want to find it. So yeah, that's all I wanted to say today. Have you enjoyed your 40 Audi experience, Ina? I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been fantastic and I'm so happy that I got to do this and to be on the podcast with you and yeah, just for loads of people to listen to if they want to and just help destroy people. those stigmas and yes. yeah eradicate them. <laughs> yeah <laughs> like that well i hope you have enjoyed this episode of the 4d audio podcast um and i will see you next week in another episode see you later